All right, our text this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, and so hang with me because this is, other than the last maybe week or two, this is about the longest text that I'll be reading, or have been reading through here. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, otherwise it is up here on the screen as well. So Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire of the mountain. At that time I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord, because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. So that, you may, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of, your, out of the, there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your, mo- your mother and, or father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you, so that you may live long and it, it may go well with you in the land of the Lord your God that he has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desires on your neighbor's house or land, male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. Now, let's be honest with me for a minute. Is there anyone in here who wishes that there were that some rules didn't exist? Here's a few. I I came across a few rules, and I I did this very specifically for the places that I have lived in my life. So here are three laws that are in that are. Take them for what they are, but they're in place. So in Detroit, Michigan, which is actually about where Emily is from, uh, I found that alligators may not be tied to fire hydrants. In one small town in Iowa, horses are forbidden to eat fire hydrants. And finally, here in this great state of Minnesota, it is illegal, so if you're doing this, please stop. It's illegal to tease skunks. So, sometimes rules can be unnecessary or even silly. It's good to hear laughter. You know, we can laugh about some of these things. Uh, and, but, but, and sometimes we even see that rules that are in place promote evil. However, God's rule for this life was designed to serve as a guidepost for how we ought to live. So my sermon and the sentence this week is this. And so again, just a reminder that this sentence is would be like my thesis of a paper. It's my summary statement that you can hopefully take with you and share uh, when people ask what was talked about on Sunday. The Ten Commandments were God's rules for godly living 
so his people would be holy, set apart for God. Now, the Ten Commandments have been uh, a primary moral guiding force for how someone ought to live for thousands of years. You see them in courthouses to this very day, though many people have tried to have them removed. But these aren't just commandments. They are declarations. They are warnings. They are promises. God spoke in, in this case, ten words early on in the creation account. Ten times. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, ten times it says, And God said. Now he is creating a certain people into a new creation with the intent of focusing on uh, new ways. He's providing ten new words, new commands, if you will, for his people. Now, most tend to focus on the negativity in the commandments, rather than what the intent was really for. Two of them are positive in how they're written. Remember the Sabbath day and honor your father and mother. Mostly, it's one don't after another. God brought Israel out of slavery. But many people, still to this day, see God's law as just imposing a different kind of slavery. Now recall that when God brought them out of slavery and called his people to be holy, that is, as we heard about in a video a few weeks ago, and you've heard this before, that they were to be set apart for God. He tells them, do not be like you, the Egyptians were when they were there. But he also commands them, this is something I mentioned I think two weeks ago, he says, also, don't be like the Canaanites who are in the land where you are headed. You are to be different. So these ten commandments were specifically designed for God's people to live differently, to live differently. Godly. Now, my first point today is this, and I think we don't have to look real far. We can look at our current context in our culture and see that this is true. Point one here God's law is seen as a burden by those who deny Him. Now, His law, God's law, is seen as a burden by them because it's opposing man's desire to control their life. Additionally, by understanding God's law, we realize that we will bear account for how we've lived, that how we live matters. Now, I went back seven years and, and found an article on CNN from uh, 2014, and it was entitled, Behold, Atheists' New Ten Commandments. And I thought this was kind of interesting because I think it really, as we show this here in a moment, it kind of fits what we're seeing in our culture, and what people really long for underneath the surface. So two atheists, they sought input from the world, and they offered $10,000 to the winning entry. They received over 2,800 submissions. And after appointing a 13-judge panel, they selected these 10 winners. So here's what they came up These are the 10 non-commandments for our age. Number one, be open-minded and be willing to alter your beliefs with new evidence. Number two, strive to understand what is most likely true, not to believe what you wish to be true. Number three, the scientific method is the most reliable way of understanding the natural world. Number four, every person has the right to control their body. Number five, God is not necessary to be a good person or to live a full and meaningful life. Number six, be mindful of the consequences of your actions and recognize that you must take responsibility for them. Number seven, treat others as you want them to treat you and can reasonably expect them to want to be treated. Think about their perspective. Number eight, we have the responsibility to, to consider others, including future generations. 
Number nine, there is no one right way to live. And number ten, leave the world a better place than you found it. Now, there's elements of some valuable things that we can gain from that. We don't have to just dismiss that all. Um, you know, we don't have to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. But in reading some of these, you realize where some of the culture stands on positions, particularly with the one like number four, where everyone has the right to control their body. You can see we are seeing the effects of where that can take us in our culture. Now, these ten non-commandments, that, that's their word, not mine, by the way. They specifically wanted to call them non-commandments. They capture the default moral code of the world we live in. They specifically wrote these because they wanted to remove themselves from the oppressive nature of commands. But what's interesting about this is that all of these things are commands. The whole purpose was to get out from the weight of the commands so that it would allow them to be free and to express themselves how they felt fit. But they are commands. They carry all of the value of moral force. Now I want to use an analogy here that I love here. It's from Francis Schaeffer. He was a Christian, he's a Christian apologist and a theologian, and this is what he said. He said, if every little baby that was ever born anywhere in the world had a tape recorder hung about his neck, and if this tape recorder only recorded the moral judgments with which this child, as he grew, bound on other men, the moral precepts might be lower than biblical law, but they would still be moral judgments. So there's a lot going on in there. What is in the world is he saying there? What he's saying is that even if words were never really uttered, if it was just simply all that was recorded were the judgments of morality that one placed on themselves. They didn't even have to have any external teaching. It, it's a, it points to the reality that we all make moral judgments. It doesn't matter whether you believe that Scripture is real or not, when it comes to the argument about do, does one make a moral argument? We all do. We all judge things on what we think is right and wrong. The question becomes, what is our source for that? Now, eventually, every person comes to that great moment, great for some, maybe not great for others, but where they will stand before God as judge. Now suppose for just a minute that instead of God asking you to do anything to speak to what you had done, he just simply hit play on that tape recorder. And each man's heart just was played out in his own words through all of the statements in which he had bound other men to moral judgment. He could hear it going on for years, thousands and thousands of moral judgments made against other men. Not just judgments on how you feel, but moral judgments. God would simply say to this man, even though he had never heard the Bible, so where do you stand in light of your moral judgments? And as the Bible points out, it says, notice what it says how we're going to be at that day. It says, our voices will be stilled. We would have to, all men will have to stand before God knowing that there are things that we have deliberately done that we knew were wrong. Nobody could deny it. So let me drive this home one more way this morning. And that is, sometimes I hear the argument, well, what about so-and-so that lives in a distant, you know, a remote island and they're on their own? And nobody told them the gospel. Are they still accountable for this? And I would say... How God judges may vary a little bit, but there are certainly commands that say that we know right and wrong based upon what we see in our world. That their acknowledgement, their level of understanding about what the gospel is will certainly be different, but we all have moral codes built into us. Now, our own moral codes, even if someone hasn't, the Ten Commandments, um, we break all the time. 
right? Even if you say, you know, forget about the Ten Commandments for a minute, I have my own list of things that I think are right and wrong, we still break them from time to time. So we can't even live how we think we should in a right way. We think we're free to choose what's right, do what we want to do, even though we don't really even know what is right for ourselves, and we can't live up even to our low standards. We need a guide outside of us to function for us as we so to, to, for us to function as we ought. The way to, to uh, follow and how to live is not by listening to your gut. It's not to go with what the first thought that pops in your head or the one that sounds the most right to you and go with it. It's to listen to God. If you want to know how to live a good life, if you want to know how to live in a way that blesses your friends and neighbors, that strengthens marriages, that builds stronger families, we'd be wise to do things God's way. Which means paying very careful attention to the Ten Commandments. Secondly, God's law points us to the path of freedom that he provides. According to scripture, these ten commands, what we call the law, is the perfect law of liberty. How often do you think about law as liberty? We often think of law as restricting and holding back, but it's as Paul says, it's the perfect law of liberty. Liberty means freedom in James chapter 1. But the one who looked into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And just a few verses later in James chapter 2, verse 12. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Now think about this for a second. Even though our world may try to tell us differently, nothing that we find in this world is absolutely free. It is shipped in a box. I'm sorry. <laughs> Skipped a paragraph there. Nothing's absolutely free. Absolute freedom is impossible. Things aren't free to do or be anything they please. They're free to become what they are. For example, an acorn is free to become an oak, not an elephant. God's Ten Commands are guiding people to who they truly were intended to be. Now imagine for a moment... If you ordered your grandchild uh, or your child a four-wheeler online. And so they ship it in a box. It's not put together. Now, you're free to put together the four-wheeler however you want. But if you want maximum freedom, maximum performance, maximum potential, what do you have to do? Well, I... You try to follow the instruction manual. I have tried to follow a lot of instruction manuals, and they're not always very clear. But you've got to put it together the right way. Otherwise, it's not going to function. So when you follow the manual, you make sure that the wheels are on right. You make sure the battery is connected properly. And that it steers correctly so that it won't just spin around in circles. Now, as I've already said, we often tend to look at rules and think that they hinder our freedom. But don't do this. Oh, well, that's hindering my freedom. Don't do that. We look at the Ten Commandments often as a list of don'ts, rules, and we miss the intent. Because the reality is it's the opposite. We have true freedom to be who we really are. And because these commands come from our God... The ma our maker, he knows what is best for us to operate at maximum performance. The good news of the law, C.S. Lewis said this, the good news of the law is like the good news of arriving on solid ground after a shortcut gone awry through mud, muck, and mire. 
After fumbling about in the, stink, the squishy, stinky mess, you are relieved to finally hit something solid, something you can trust, something you can count on. We often live our lives in rebellion to these laws, or we try to find shortcuts, but it always ends in trouble. This is particularly fitting, as I shared with a couple of you before the service. Yesterday, we went to, uh, I took, the, took Emily and the kids to go to the ice race here at Peterson Lake, and we drove down to park and uh, didn't know where to go, and so we ended up in the squishiest, muddiest part where the only cars that were supposed to go there were the ones in the race. So here we have a non-four-wheel drive vehicle in the mud, worried whether or not we're going to be able to get back out. And so you can imagine the relief of finding solid ground again. So another question for you. Have you ever thought about how much better your life would be if you kept the Ten Commandments? I hear people, and I'm guilty of this too at times, I hear people all the time grumbling about rules and regulations. But think about what an amazing, amazingly different world we would live in if people obeyed these ten rules. <coughs> See, if everyone obeyed these rules, we wouldn't need copyright laws, we wouldn't need locks on our doors, we wouldn't need to lock our cars, we wouldn't need weapons for protection, or courts, or prisons, or the welfare system? Can you imagine what life would be like if all the people obeyed the Ten Commandments? The law is not an ugly thing. It is good and righteous and holy. I've come across people that have told me it's, it's burdensome to follow these rules. They'd rather just live how they feel. Do you know how many laws there are in the United States? Anybody want to make a guess? How many laws there are in the United States? Two million. Uh, I thought you were going to say too many, and that's about two million. That's, that's a great guess. I, uh, so it's a trick question because nobody knows. There are 20,000 laws in the books regulating gun ownership alone. Now, back in 2008, a House committee decided to have the Congressional Research Service do what I just asked you. They wanted them to dig back, though, and actually figure out how many laws there were. And actually, they specifically criminal offenses. This isn't even all the law. So just criminal offenses in federal law. And so they responded five years later that they lacked the manpower and resources to answer such a question. The Ten Commandments were not instructions on how to get out of Egypt. They are rules for helping the people to stay free. Now there's one more important thing here to notice before we close, is that the law, make sure you know this, the law came after the Gospel. Now you might be thinking, wait a second here, the Gospel was in the New Testament. And that's what we often think about, that part of it. We think about Jesus. And so the law comes after the gospel, after the good news of deliverance. God did not come to his people in, is in Egypt and say, I've got ten commandments for you. I want you to get these right, and I'm going to come back in five years. And if you've gotten your life cleaned up, I'll set you free. That's how some people view Christianity. Think about that for just a second. Some people view Christianity as, I must accomplish these rules. I must satisfactorily do enough good. I must be uh, of good enough standard. And then, then and if then, God will deliver me. But the story doesn't happen that way. The law came after the gospel. I've heard it said this way, God has rules, and if I follow the rules, God will love me and save me. But that's not how the story plays out. 
I've heard this sentiment as well, that they didn't think that they, I've heard this a couple times in Minnesota from people in the community that have said, I just, I don't think that I could walk through the church doors. Why? Because of everything that they have done wrong in their life. And all they could envision was judgment from people. Because they've experienced it everywhere else. And they've come to expect that. Past experience then was projected upon God and said, well, I've done so many things wrong, how could I possibly be loved by this God? The Israelites were an oppressed people back in Egypt. We know that. But God said this. He said, I hear your cry. I will save you because I love you. And and when you are saved, when you are free, when you are forgiven, now I'm going to give you a new way to live. So these commandments, these were not designed They did not have the intent to just be a list of rules or to be things we look at and say, man, this is just, this is cramping my style. If I could just do this. They were intended to point us to the path of true life. Let me give you one other scenario from the past. Stuff happens in life. We all know that. We deal with all sorts of uh, pain, trials, anxiety, stress. And often when that anxiety happens and there's there's this inner conflict between individuals, it could be within a home, it could be anywhere. But what we often do is then we promote things for our comfort, our benefit, Rather than saying, how do we work through this? How do we value one another? How do we put God first in this environment? How do we make sure that we are seeking to live differently? Because in our world, they will tell us often to disregard things, to push things out of our way, to not address problems, um, but to just instead, you know, if it's, if it's getting in your path of comfort and it's just easier to address it another way, then just plow ahead and do that. But I believe that the commandments are here really for us, again, to to keep God first in our lives, and secondly, it's a way to help us to know how best to deal in relationship with one another. Because relationship with one another is kind of hard, isn't it, at times? There's a it's mess. It's a mess sometimes. I imagine that uh, you probably can all think of a handful of times, I know I can, that I just as soon say, you know, man, if I could just kind of push this out of my life and just keep moving, things would feel a lot smoother. But you're still living with it. It's still there. It's still present. We need to hear this again and again. This is important. Salvation is not a reward for your obedience. Salvation is the reason for obedience. Jesus did not say, if you obey my commandments, I will love you. He said, those who love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. All that we do is because of what he has done for us. We are to be a people set free because of what Jesus did for us. And if that's really where we are at, if that's where we long to be, then we should strive to live into these Ten Commandments because they are the perfect law of liberty. It's through these laws, these commands, that we can find freedom. And so the Ten Commandments were God's rule for godly living. So that we, his people, could be holy, which is to be set apart. Please pray with me.
Heavenly Father, we, we come before you as we, we think about these laws, these Ten Commandments. Lord, we know, I mean, we, we look around at the laws that we see in our, in our country and in our world, and, and we can recognize, like some of them I read at the beginning, that there's, you know, some of them are foolishness, and some of them are kind of silly, and that's the intent. Lord, we also acknowledge that some of our man-made laws are, um, are doing nothing but promoting evil. And so we, we know that we are to discern uh, right and wrong through your spirit. We are uh, not to blindly follow the laws that man put forth. And yet, Lord, we are thankful that you have promoted or provided us with the, the perfect law of liberty. Lord, we confess too often we muddle up this thing called life because we choose to do things our own way. We often distrust those, that those words truly will bear out the fruit with which you promised they would. Lord, we ask that we first, um, we first continue to keep our focus on who is first in our lives. Lord, that that is you. We know that when, when conflict arises, when anxiety is present, we often, it often causes our eyes t- to uh, stop looking up and to look straight ahead and, and to focus on the thing that is right in front of us. And Lord, there are times where we must focus on that which is right in front of us. And yet you've given us commands about how to deal with one another, uh, how to come together in love and in grace and in humility and seek uh, to reconcile in all that we do. Lord, help us to be holy, to be set apart for you. Help us to do that because we know that you love us so great that we have nothing, uh, nothing seems more fitting or better than to do just that. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the closing song, and I will uh, read the benediction here. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you, now and forevermore. Amen.